So we'll start right in the beginning. Um, hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, uh, thanks for this uh, quick notice about the sound quality. Um, my name is Jan Bundesmann. I'm a consultant with ATEX. Um, I will guide you through the next 30 to 40 minutes. There's also Jonas Kruistadt present in the chat who will answer your questions if you have any. Um, today's topic is configuration management with Puppet and Ansible in Orcarino. But before we um, give you a quick demonstration of that topic, we will um, show you some basic overview of ATIX and Orcarino. Here at ATIX, we care a lot about data center automation in general. To this topic belong every kind of configuration management. Um, but nowadays, we also care a lot about container stuff, Docker, everything around Docker, like Kubernetes and different Kubernetes distributions. Ocarino plays a role in all of these topics. That's why it has such a special role for us and also because it's our product. So why do we care about this data center automation? There's a lot of reasons why it is advisable to use a lot of automation in your data center. First, it uh, can be used to speed up all kinds of deployments. So you can quickly set up new infrastructure in your data center. Since automation reproduces well-defined steps, you can assume that uh, all your workflow is more stable than it, it does if you do everything by hand. Again, for the same reason, it's also reproducible. So it's easy to roll out the same kind of infrastructure for a second time. And even more interesting nowadays, because data centers get larger and larger, it is possible to orchestrate services. And eventually it could even enable you to kind of offer something like a self-service portal to your users, your clients, your customers, however you call them. All this is only possible if you automate as much as possible inside your data center. And to that end, we work a lot with Ocarino. Ocarino is um, a tool which does the whole life cycle management of your service. Um, it can care for a lot of different operating systems in different kinds of manners. It uh, can use several kinds of configuration management tools. It can talk to different hypervisors and it can talk to several cloud providers. Um, we as ATIX uh, offer support if you are a user of Ocarino, we offer consulting, we offer trainings, and we also have an engineering department which does active development for Ocarino and cares for quality assurance. The basic tasks of Ocarino can be subsumed in three areas. So the first thing you servers encounter is their deployment. After deployment, it's release management and con configuration management that take over. And all these aspects can be dealt with using Ocarino. Let's start with deployment. There are several ways how Ocarino can care for deploying new hosts. Let's think of bare metal hosts. So you have some servers sending around your data center. For instance, it's possible that you boot from some minimal discovery image, which has basic information about your Ocarino, like where to find it. Um, so this discovery image then would search for the Ocarino and query about information that it requires to install the basic operating system. Another way is that your server, be it a bare metal server or a virtual machine, 
um, boots and then calls from a DHCP server um, where the next Pixie boot uh, instance is, which also can be the Ocarino. Also the DHCP server can already be the Ocarino. And then dynamically all this required content is queried. Or you can just deploy a ready-made image from some template and um, you clone a VM from that template. Um, all these mechanisms then run through some automatic way of installing your host. And after a host has been installed, it re reports to the Ocarino as being installed. And from that point on, other tools like release management and configuration management can take over. For release management, um, what we mean with that is that we can use the Ocarino to sync repositories and the synced repositories um, can be versioned. We use something called content view, which basically is can be thought of as a snapshot of a repository. So at a given time, you would um, just say, create a content view version of my repository at that time and give it a version number like 13.0. At a later point, you would increase this version because new package versions are synchronized. This can be done for basically all types of Linux package repositories. And then there's one specialty which originally was invented by Red Hat. It's called the Errata. Errata are kind of meta information about vulnerabilities, which packages are affected from certain vulnerabilities and which package upgrades would uh, remove these vulnerabilities. And these are instantly available for Red Hat, SUSE and Oracle Linux. And we as ATEX, we provide these errata also for CentOS, Ubuntu and Debian. So these end on the synchronized repositories. You always have a kind of an overview which of your hosts are um, can be targeted through some security vulnerability. And you can also patch this, those, of course. <laughs> For configuration management, there's a large variety of, of ways how you can configure your hosts. So the um, first thing that happens is that you can vary the, the things that happen during installation of your hosts. So you write templates that kind of define which software is already installed during the installation, which network interfaces are created and so on. This is like the first step of configuration management. Afterwards, we have more sophisticated tools, namely Ansible, Puppet and SaltStack. Um, those can be also pre-configured on your hosts, so they can control the configuration of these machines throughout their whole lifetime. There's another tool we mentioned, um, OpenSCAP, which is not really a configuration management tool. It's a tool for reporting um, the security status of your machine. So it can re send reports to your Ocarino. You can view them in a very nice fashion there and decide of which next steps are necessary to be made there. Um, and of course, we can configure our machines uh, in a way that it's possible to connect to them through Ansible or SSH, basically. So you can just use the Ocarino to send SSH commands to all of your hosts. Um, if we think of the software that is doing all these things in core, there is something called Foreman. Um, and the form plugin called Catello. Those are the key components of what eventually makes out the Ocarino. Those two are open source tools. We are actively developing also for these tools and giving back our contributions to the community. We publish the Ocarino as a complete package 
which also includes uh, an installer and already helps to install the configuration management tools. Um, so we have this already mentioned engineering department, we have quality assurance. So we have regular tests of new releases of the Ocarina and the included software. We have these errata which we provide for Ocarino users. Um, then we create templates for host deployment for all these different kinds of operating systems that can be deployed through Ocarino and the client software that is needed for a host to connect to the Ocarino. We have support for our clients and we have of course the consultants that can help you set up your Ocarino to design all the necessary uh, environmental stuff for your Ocarino and we also offer trainings around that. So this uh, as a whole package can be seen as the Ocarino. So it's not only just a piece of software but there's a lot of things that enter Ocarino additionally in, to that software. So this is the let's say starting point for me if I work with the Ocarino. This is an overview of all the installed hosts or all the hosts that are managed through my Ocarino installation. Um, you see we have basically one for every operating system that can be used through Ocarino, that can be managed through Ocarino. Um, you see all the major enterprise distributions and you see at the bottom that we also can manage Windows servers. Um, although the management of Windows servers is a bit more tricky and has less features available than Linux management. Anyways, it is possible to deploy Windows hosts and um, if you do so, you can also do, for example, configuration management. Um, we have uh, several points in our menu at the left. The first one is a, a general thing monitor. This is where you can have an overview over a lot of things. Basically the dashboard gives you an overview of all the content you have inside your Ocarino. You can have a look at all the facts gathered around about your hosts. You can see reports and several things. You can have an overview of the task currently running or previously running on your Ocarino. The content point summarizes everything concerning the release management and the patch management. So you can manage which repositories you manage through your Ocarino um, and how you organize all those repositories. This basically goes through the points life cycle and yeah, life cycle. Under host, we have the host list, for instance, and also a lot of information that are necessary for host deployment. So these are the first two major functions of our Ocarino. And today's topic, configuration with management with Puppet and Ansible, can mainly be found inside this Puppet point. Uh, and inside this configure point, sorry. Um, so in configure, we basically find those topics that uh, concern large scale uh, host management, I would say. Um, so besides the configuration management tools, Salt, Puppet and Ansible, we find something called host groups, which are kind of interface to template the host creation. But let's go on with the configuration management itself. Um, configuration management in general means um, that we can in a declarative way describe a system's desired state and there are basically two ways of how these information can arrive at your hosts. 
One is that you have a master machine which pushes its information to the um, hosts. The other way is that an agent is running on them and calling from the master the desired state. And these extreme ways are uh, re represented through Puppet and Ansible. Like Puppet um, has this master client approach where the clients are running an agent and pulling their desired state from the master. Ansible always uses this push approach. Salt takes an intermediate role and can act in both ways, um, but through Ocarino only this pulling approach is possible. So that just as a general forward to configuration management. Um, historically, uh, Foreman, so one of the components, so the base components of Ocarino can be seen as a kind of a front end to Puppet. That's why Puppet is very strongly um, encoded in everything concerning Ocarina. Ansible gains more weight nowadays because Ansible is a Red Hat's desired configuration management tool and Red Hat is a very strong contributor to Foreman. So that's why these two tools um, are both very popular and can be used quite well through Ocarina. For Salt, it's a bit diff different. It has a lower number of users, but still integration inside Ocarina is quite well, and it offers similar functionalities as, for instance, Puppet does. Now let's start with a quick insight into Puppet. We have these five menu points here. And basically, I want to show you what these menu points mean and then try to explain you in that turn also how Puppet works. Let's start with the environments. So Puppets can use several environments where an environment is a collection of modules and information about how these modules get distributed to the host. Or in other terms, the modules are the way of describing the desired states. And um, out of these modules, eventually the catalog of the desired configuration can be compiled. Um, within Ocarino, an environment just represents this collection of classes and modules. So the class is the, let's say, smallest unit within Puppet configuration management. A class can, for example, be, um, well, we will see some examples, but for example, the NTP server would be one class. And if this is applied to a host, it configures NTP configuration. We have this concept of environments in, in Puppet. We do not have something similar in Ansible. The configuration of the host itself is not done in these environments. This is basically done inside the host configuration. So the environments just collect all the classes you want to have in one environment. Um, if we see, click on this button, classes here on the right, we will see all the classes that are present in the environment called production. We could have chosen another way of coming there if we went through configure and then go through the puppet classes. Now the advantage is that we already have a filter set for our environment. Since there is no other environment, we um, see all the classes that are present. So what you now can see, there is a large number of classes present. They are first installed by hand on the Ocarina. In a second step, you see here a button import environments from the Ocarina host in that case. And um, Ocarina then lists all the classes it can find inside the corresponding directory. 
Um, you see, there are a lot of subclasses. So Puppet uses this double colon style to separate class and subclass. And well, the list is quite long. We have 157 classes. Let's have a look at one example. So because I don't want to go through the whole list, I use the filter field here and say it should be in our environment and the name should be MTP because that's the first example I want to show you. And if I now click on search, I will end up with the class MTP. I can already see that it's assigned to several host groups. I can see that 11 hosts directly have been assigned to that. And there is a lot of parameters and variables. If I click on the class's name, I see all the settings. So here is, for example, in a way to assign classes to host groups. And then we have something called smart class parameters and smart variables. Smart class parameters um, are all the parameters that a class offers as a kind of interface to the use. So you can think of it as a function header in low level programming languages. So you have like a header that defines which input parameters you can give to a class. Um, you see those are quite a lot. And if I scroll down, I see eventually something with the flag before, which is an indicator that we have manually overwritten the default value defined in the class definition. If I click on it, so basically this variable defines which NTP servers are used on my hosts. I see that I have some default value here set, which overrides the default which is defined in the class. And in a second step, I could also override this. So by default, this would point to these two name servers only for the host with the FQDN, CentOS7.demo.atx, there's only one of them. Let's just quickly go through the smart variables. They are closely related. Smart variables can also be used within classes, but they are not exposed through the classes header, but may be used through some lookup call inside the class code. Um, as you've seen, there's a lot of classes and attribution might become a bit complicated. Now we have also something called config groups. Config groups um, is a way to combine classes to a logical group. So if you worked with Puppet already before, you might know this concept of roles and profiles. This is a way of doing something similar within Ocarina. So I just defined some config group called web server. And this includes several Apache classes. And then because um, I think this might be useful, the class crony, so the newer version of um, NTP. And because this web server might use dockerized applications, there is also Docker included and a firewall because this will probably be exposed to the internet. And since um, I'm planning to run Docker images, for instance, I can also include some proxy modules, whatever. So it is possible to combine, to aggregate several classes inside one of these config groups. Now, how do I assign them to hosts? There are two ways we already saw within those classes list that is possible to assign those classes through the host groups and directly to hosts. 
So let's just try this out. If we go to some host group like the Santos host group, we can see that there is, um, if we edit this host group, that there is a tab puppet classes and we see the single classes, we could add them. So these are the modules. And if I click on the plus, I see the actual classes inside. And I can also add the whole config group. Now let's have a look what they actually do. We go to this machine, CentOS 7, bmo.apix. And just have a look at the current NTP configuration. So this can also be seen as a kind of a configuration management and now execute a command on one of the hosts. So this is the default output if I run a job. So success, successful job, of course it didn't do anything. And I see that currently the server has one NTP server entity. And what I now want to do I hope you see the correct thing. I go to this host interface and say edit. And now I can go to the parameters where I find there is this service entry. Now, what it could basically do is NTP add another time server. Submit it here. Now, the way Puppet runs is that every half an hour, the agent calls for its desired state. We now want to trigger it by hand. So, we adjust this job definition slightly and say puppet agent minus T, which is triggering the manual run of the puppet agent. And after this, it gives out the hopefully modified NTP configuration. So this is the typical output of puppet run if you do it manually and you see already from the output that there have been some changes. There's been added a new line. And also in the final output, we see there are now two NTP servers. So as I mentioned, it's not the normal way to trigger this manually. I just did this for demonstration purpose, usually Puppet runs every half an hour and queries how the state should be, and then tries to force the configuration into the desired state. Which means if I, for instance, manually delete this line or manually edit in any way this configuration file, every half an hour it will be rendered back to the desired version. So the window of undesired configuration is very short. So are there questions about Puppet? Otherwise I would go on with Ansible. Okay, so let's have a look at Ansible. Ansible is a bit younger than Puppet. And as I said, it follows the approach of pushing information or desired states to our hosts. Um, 
the structure is that of roles. So a role in Ansible roughly corresponds to a class and puppet. So a role is a collection of tasks um, that are required to perform a specific, well, uh, to achieve a specific goal. Um, I would also install them manually on my Ocarina master and can then import them on the Ocarina web interface. And they would appear here in this Ansible roles window. So there is this import button, which would allow me to import more roles. And we see the list of all the installed roles. Um, similar as with the parameters in Puppet, we have variables here. It's just a different name. And let's um, focus on this role called Manala MOTD. So this role basically modifies the message of the day. So the welcome message you see if you log in, for example, through SSH. Um, and we can click here on variables to see how to parameterize this role. And sorry, I forgot to, to mention, but we also can see to which ho to how many host groups and to how many hosts this role has been assigned. Um, there are three different variables that can be used to modify the behavior of this role. First is the file, which by default uh, points to etc MOTD. Then the message to some short text string that will appear within the message of the day and the template, which is a path to a predefined way of how to render this message. So for instance, if you have a look again at this uh, message, um, we put it to this default value. These are host with Verwalter from Ocarina with Ansible. So in English, this host is managed by Ocarina through Ansible. So every time you would log in, you would see this message. And again, as for public class parameters, you can override them for specific hosts. You could also override them for a whole host group for a certain operating system, for a domain. And you can define a hierarchy, um, which kind of matcher um, has which priority. The template. is a file name which can be chosen from a set of predefined templates. Um, for instance, it can point to template Stegosaurus J2, or here we see two overrides to Dragon J2, Rhino J2. That's like the, the first insight in, into how to define which roles you have available and how to configure them. How you, will you apply them to your host? Let's go back to our host overview. And we want to, again, to play around with this CentOS host we had here. We see, if we go to edits, okay, have it open twice. Under Ansible roles, it is already here on the side where Ansible roles, the assigned ones are listed, it is grayed out because it has already been declared within the host group. So every center seven host gets this role assigned. Now just have a, let's have, just have a look at the currently set message of the day. So the current message of the day is boring. So 
which means probably the role has not run yet. And we want to improve this message of the day. How can we do this? So we go back to our host. And like part of the integration of Ansible means that it already appears here in the drop down menu for the remote job execution. And you see there is run Ansible roles, which would apply all the roles that are assigned to this host. Let's do this. Um, again, we have only this one host here. Let's see what happens. If you are familiar with Ansible, you see this is a typical output. Now there are a lot of roles assigned. So all those roles are now played. And eventually we also find that there is a task on our MLTD, the template task is applying this template. And now we check what happened. Our new message of the day contains the stegosaurus and the already mentioned message. This host is managed by Ocarino through Ansible. So let's just go one step further. Um, like um, a way how to use Ansible for mass host configuration. Basically, you assign the host to the host groups and individually to each host. Um, so Ocarino has inside its database stored which host has which Ansible host. So it could just mark them here and here in this uh, extended action menu, there is one point, play Ansible roles. This, for instance, would trigger a run of all the roles that are assigned to these hosts. And it would be applied to the four hosts here. Ansible run is also performed at a certain time after the installation of a host. So like a default 10 minutes after the host has reported as being installed, Ansible is run for the first time. So you can use this for a kind of automatic base installation or base configuration of your hosts. There is uh, one other way um, to let's say use this for a limited number of hosts. Let's say we want to have something like um, every host which name contains something like OS. So the query of this filter line is similar to SQL statements, basically because in the background there is an SQL query running. And then I could, for instance, save this filter as a bookmark. Say so bookmark the search and call it demo. Now it would appear here, so every time I click on this, I would end up with this query. Ansible runs are triggered through job templates. And the one which is responsible for doing this mass running of Ansible roles is this Ansible default. Let's have a quick look how this is 
created. So this is an embedded Ruby template. And what it does is it create a playbook with a list of the roles assigned to the host. So it's important to, I mean, um, embedded Ruby is quite easily readable. And there's also inline help if you have to write your own templates. But this is basically a very simple template and you can also already preview it for your hosts. So for our Center 7 demo, this template would yield a playbook which contains three roles. And if I want to use this template to run, I can say Ansible roles, Ansible default, and I say run, and I get to a form which is similar to the one for the host remote execution um, form, but now with all the empty fields, so now no um, predefined host entry. So I can, for example, use the demo big bookmark I just defined, which looks for all the hosts having an OS inside. This would resolve to three hosts as we had before. And now I can say execute now, which would run Ansible roles immediately, the playbooks immediately. And I can schedule some later execution, define a date, or I can even say have a recurring execution. So like daily run of my playbook, or I can just enter, for instance, a cron line. So that's basically how you can use Ansible and Puppet from Ocarina. Do you have any questions at this point? Okay, so I have one question in the chat. Um, when using Puppet, each Puppet run can be viewed under all hosts and the specific host and its reports. Um, is it possible to achieve the same for the Ansible scheduled execution? Um, So you're saying you can see it through monitor jobs and you want to filter it for a specific host, basically. Is that what you're asking? Um, uh, oh yeah, okay, I'm already there. <laughs> Um, so these are the reports for the, mm -hmm. We have the reports from the host, the demonstration host we use today. And you see that here we have the last run eight minutes ago, ago with one applied um, task, three skipped tasks. And I can even see the detailed output. The question, another question is, is there support for Lua, L-U-A? Um, I'm sorry, I have to ask, um, what do you mean by L-U-A?
Um, okay, so but how do you want to use LUA? Okay, thanks. Any more questions? So I want to thank everybody who attended today. And if you have any more questions and afterwards, you can write us an email.